What's cracking, yo? Welcome back to Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. What's cracking, what's cracking, what's cracking, y'all? Back with another reaction video. This one a little bit different. It's not just Larry Bird. It's some other uh, notable athletes in the world of Boston sports. Now, this one was recommended by two people, actually, Book Mom and Dutch T. And let me run it to you, how it all went down. So Book Mom hits me up in the recommendations uh, video where I would like people to put all their recommendations for videos there and content. She says, there's a Larry Bird, Bobby Orr, and Ted Williams interview you might like. It's about three great Boston players in basketball, baseball, and hockey. And I hadn't seen the comment. Yeah, I actually never got, I usually get notifications for it, but I never got a notification for it. And then Dutch T hit me up on another video like, bro, go check your, your recommendation video. I was like, what? I got some new stuff on there. So I went over there and I saw Book Mom's comment and then Dutch T replied to Book Mom. I agree. I came here to recommend it too. It's 1992 home video quality, but totally worth it. Everything in it is new, never, never before seen. It gives you insights into what makes a great player just by comparing the responses of the three men. Everything very interesting and there's one very special section. It's about 45 minutes long, now you know. So you might need to break it up. There are four commercial breaks, but the commercials are cut out except two short ones featuring Ted and Bobby. Be sure to see the extra footage after the host signs off. I also noticed that it was Bird who, off camera, said that Bill Russell should have been included. I agreed. So did some research. I read where Russell was a semi-recluse during a short time in the early 90s when the interview occurred. That is actually true. He was. He was. It's too bad because Russell possessed the same star qualities the other three players mentioned. While reacting, try to notice these similarities. I didn't know much about Williams or Orr, but this video led me to go watch more videos of them. The three men had off the court field rink differences. Williams was John Wayne in baseball uniform. Orr seems like such a polite and kind person. Bird's dry wit always makes me laugh, but in this video it's fun to see several times what makes him laugh. All right. She also added, I don't know why no one has ever reacted to it. I know the Bird gang will love it. I still go back and watch it because it's entertaining and I gain new insights. I suggested it to another reactor who said he would do it, but I think he forgot. Here's a link. If you can queue up two videos into a reaction, I suggest, I suggest starting with this one minute clip of Bird explaining that he looked up at Orr's number every home game. I've heard that Orr teared up when he watched this when it first released. Book Mom and Dutch T. Brilliant breakdown. Thank you for recommending uh, this one to me. Uh, definitely something new. Um, and I'm willing to give it a shot as long as Larry Bird's in it. <laughs> no, but I'm, in I'm, interested in, I'm interested in seeing what the banter is and going back and forth and what type of questions. Just, you know, what the general conversation is. And yeah, I can definitely, it makes sense to, uh, you know, take a one minute clip of Bird instead of doing a, a reaction video of you know, like a, a one minute Bird clip. If it transitions right into this video and it all makes sense, I think that's a perfect idea for. So thank you for sharing both videos with me, and giving me the idea to use, uh, you know, transition in between and you know tie it all together because it is related, and it makes sense. Um, I'll tell you guys right now, I don't know shit about baseball or hockey. Definitely not interested in baseball. Um, you know, I, I know like some big names. That's about it. I, I don't follow baseball. Been to one baseball game my whole life, and it was minor league. Um, and uh, hockey, I'm not generally. I'm not interested in hockey either. Um, I used to really like hockey when I was a kid. I used to play NHL '94 all the time on Sega Genesis. But um, I started getting into hockey a little bit because one of my ex girlfriends, her and her family was a big hockey fan, and you know I'd watch it lightly and loosely, you know, just to have something to talk about and get into some competitive fervor. And uh, she was a Pittsburgh Penguins fan. Uh, she loved the, the goalkeeper at the time. Uh, Flurry, I think his name was Flurry, last name Flurry. 
and I I rolled with the uh, Washington Capitals because I was in the D.C. area, and they were rivals, the Caps versus the Pens. So I was like, oh, it's, screw it. I'm a Caps fan now. Crazy thing is, the Caps ended up winning the Stanley Cup. And I almost, I'm mad. I should have went to the, the, the parade, and I didn't go. I didn't go to the parade, and I didn't go downtown during the um, the championship game. I'm mad. I, was, I do regret not going to both of those. They, they looked amazing. But here we are. I'll check out both videos, and uh, let's get this thing popping. Let's see what it's all about. Once again, thank you, Book Mom and Dutch T. It wasn't long ago that Larry Bird revealed that he has a hero that comes to mind before every game he plays here at Boston Garden. You know, a lot of people always ask me, why are you the only one who always looks at the flag when the National Anthem's playing? I don't really look at the flag. I look at Bobby Orr's number because I've never seen Bobby Orr play hockey, but just being around him gives me a tingling feeling for some reason, and that sort of gets me fired up. And uh, I don't know why, but it does. You know, and that started back when I was a, a rookie. You know, you, you get there, and you're looking up there, and you see this number, and all of a sudden, you get fired up. I never could understand it, but that's me. <laughs> really something how that fires him up and what a great role model or was as a hockey player and how many knee injuries did that guy have and still be able to come back and come back and compete. Final. Definitely a local Massachusetts or Boston sports show. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special one hour edition of I'm Sports assuming. Final. Maybe not. First and foremost, let me tell you, this is a show for the fans. Tonight, we brought three people together who have never been physically together before, but who are together in every way in our collective minds. Three people who have collectively spanned seven decades of performing at a level reserved for a chosen few. Three people who have appeared in a total of 39 All-Star Games. Two of these three are in their respective Hall of Fames, and the third will soon be. Two of these three have had their numbers retired, four and nine, by their respective teams, and soon number 33 will be. Collectively, they were the MVPs in their leagues eight times. They have done things that have never been done before and most assuredly will never be done again. We said this is a show for the fans, and as a result, we welcome four other television markets because of the incredible interest. Hartford, Bangor, Portland, and Terre Haute, Indiana, plus WBZ Radio Simulcast. The seven decades began at the end of the 1930s, when the kid from San Diego, California, came to Fenway Park. It's over a half century later, and people are still talking about the most charismatic, most engaging, most individualistic, and arguably the greatest hitter that has ever lived. His career highlights are mind-boggling. Twice the MVP, player of the decade in the 1950s. He won baseball's triple crown twice. Six-time batting champion, four-time home run champion, all-star 18 times, and of course, the Hall of Fame. And still five full years were taken from the prime of his career due to military service. Mm. Ted Williams, like his two companions Thank you for your tonight, service. had an uncanny flair for the dramatic. He also had a tempestuous relationship with the press and the fans, while at the same time possessing under his bigger-than-life image a heart of gold for those less fortunate, especially for the Jimmy Fund. I got to where I, I wouldn't, uh, um, I didn't like him. And I, I got to admit, I think I was treated unfairly at a lot of times. So I, I developed the habit because of their lousy writing and the response some of the guys in the stands I uh, reacted to their writing. Um, I said, well, I ain't ever going to tip my hat again. See, now I'm going to give you a line that I'm going to say tonight. That I have this confession. And it is the truth. That I have tipped my hat a thousand times. In my heart to the people in New England. For their generosity, their concern, their support of this fun, great fun called Jimmy. If 
Eddie Ballgame is the raging bull of Boston sports, and Bobby Orr and Larry Bird were at Sacred Cows. Bobby and the battling Bruins in the medium of television combined for what truly was the golden era of Bruins hockey, and without question, providing a magnificent link in the chain between the Ted Williams and Larry Bird eras. With a young Bobby Orr, the Bruins brought the first Stanley Cups to town in 29 years. Westfall rolled it in front, Sanderson tried a shot that was wide and keen and cleared a Bucknado. Bobby Orr, behind the net to Sanderson, to Orr! Bobby Orr! That was the picture. That was the picture we saw earlier of him like flying horizontally through the air. He just jumped. That had to be the picture. I bet he said, listen, 29 years? He said, I ain't letting it. I ain't letting it get to three decades. Uh uh. Scores in the Boston Bruins! That's one of the Stanley Cups! Certainly a very exciting moment here in the Boston Garden. Scotty Bowman out there congratulating the Bruins. There's a happy fan. He's kissing Bobby Orr. Orr controlled the game like none have ever done, nor likely to do again. It has been said that Bobby Orr is the single most talented performer that we have ever seen in any sport anywhere. And probably the closest we have ever come seeing a performer that has been touched by the hand of God himself. He had an unmatched style, a certain purity. Record book show, all-star eight times, best defenseman eight times, MVP of the playoffs twice, MVP of the regular season three times, first defenseman ever to win a league scoring title, which he did twice, and of course, the Hall of Fame. Rinks were built. UHF television antennas were sold in record numbers. I don't know anything about the sport or the history of the sport to compare that like to, to other greats. But based on what he says, it sounds like a pretty impeccable resume so far. Numbers and more kids are playing more hockey today because of this one man. His impact on the sport in this town have been enormous. In short, or is magic. And like his basketball and baseball counterparts that are here tonight, he is one of the three untouchables in the Boston sports scene. Okay, that says a lot. I'll guarantee you, I'll give 100% every time I come out. And if I get a torn toenail or something, I won't sit out. I'll play as hard as I can every night. And I hope I can bring excitement to the fans and I'll never give up. That was one promise that was most assuredly kept. He came to Boston billed as the savior of the most storied franchise in professional sports. And save it he did. Not once in his professional career did Larry Bird play in front of an empty seat at the Boston Garden. He brought the Celtics and professional basketball in this town to heights never before imagined. He led the Celtics to three world championships. Three times he was named the NBA Most Valuable Player. Twice he was named Playoff MVP. He was the NBA Rookie of the Year in 1980. And for the first nine years of his career, he was named to the first team NBA All-Stars. But numbers and awards did not begin to tell a tale of Bird's impact on the Celtics and the city of Boston. No one worked harder on the floor than Larry Bird and no one worked harder to make himself better. He brought a Puritan work ethic to the game that Celtic fans love. The true mark of a superstar is to elevate the play of those around him. Bird did that and more. When the game was on the line, Larry always seemed to make the key play. Now there's a steal by Bird. Underneath the DJ, lays it in. Right up one second. Y'all know. Y'all know I can't help myself. I got to do it. <laughs> Oh, they're still by Bird. Oh, they're still Boston goes up. Rest in peace. What a play by Bird. Game gets close, or or something happens when it seems like everything's falling apart during a game. The great athletes can step above everybody else and take their game to another level. They don't rise to occasions. The the tougher it got, and the more pressure was on the more all three of them loved it and welcome back live here we are bobby ted and larry it's a thrill for us to have you here needless to say but you're here as fans ted came all the way from florida to be here larry's it's two hours past his bedtime and you jump <laughs> off a of bay banks uh, billboard <laughs> just to be here tonight but to uh, tell me about the fact that you guys are fans ted i guess you i would start with you here fans of these guys and I certainly am. I mean, you know, here I'm the old guy of this trio and, and um, followed the careers of both of them. And um, I think any true sports fan would uh, say that in their particular sports, nobody was any better 
or ever as good, probably. Larry called you Mr. Williams. I thought that was kind of unique. I, I can't I, wait to meet Mr. Yeah, Williams, he I know, said. I what know. was that? I mean, you have a genuine love for baseball, too. Oh, no question about it. I used to play, and uh, it was my first love. Uh, it's just that basketball came along. I grew a little bit and um, sort of stuck with it. But I enjoy watching baseball games. I'm an avid fan, and uh, anybody can hit 400, you got to like them. <laughs> <laughs> you used to go to St. Louis. You used to take that van and go to oh, see yeah. the Cardinals play and Stan Musial, huh? Watch a lot of games in the summer, too, on cable, and watch all the Red Sox games as many as I can. And I'm a big baseball fan, no question about it. Um, just got through watching the Bruins play. So he said, you know, anybody that hits a 400, you got to love them. I'm assuming he's talking about a batting average. What's What would be like an average batting average for, you know, an average MLB player? Before I come over here, I don't know all the rules, but... Uh, <laughs> You don't have to. Bobby, it's funny because we were waiting. Ted and Larry were here first, and uh, Ted says, well, where's the great one? <laughs> I guess he was talking about you. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I'm obviously thrilled to be here with, with Larry and Ted. I've, I've heard a lot about Ted Williams, and I've, in the last couple of years, come to know Ted, and we've had a wonderful time together, and, and I certainly enjoy being with him. And I've watched Larry play a lot, and uh, he's certainly an incredible athlete, and uh, uh, he'll go down as one of the one of the greats. Well, see, uh, how's, he, how's he as a fisherman, Ted? Bobby. You well, have, no I gotta say he's pretty good. Uh, we, um, we had a great week up on a tremendous river, the Gascopedia in, in uh, Quebec. And uh, uh, he showed me uh, an awful lot. I, in fact, uh, I was amazed at how good he really was. <laughs> And uh, so, so, so. I took a lot of other heat with it, but <laughs> during the evening that we just got together this evening, why, uh, Larry was telling me about uh, uh, his uh, liking fishing, and uh, I used to fish in the same state, Indiana, down there in the, in the uh, what's the name of that river? Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe. <laughs> Tippecanoe. <laughs> I'm surprised. I was fish. based out there in primary flying, you know, and but I didn't get a chance to fish out there. All right, we're going to take a break here and come back. Uh, there are three of you guys here, and Larry, you and I talked just before uh, uh, Ted and Bobby showed up that there could have been a fourth here, and of course we know it was Bill Russell, and we'll come back and talk about uh, if there are three uh, guys of your level, if there was going to be a fourth, it would be him, but uh, he's not here tonight. We'll come back and talk much more about your careers and really the reasons that you're here tonight as we continue with our very special edition of uh, Sports Final. Stay with us. Nobody on last of the eighth down. Jack Fisher into his windup. Here's the pitch. Williams swings, and there's a long drive to deep right. That ball is gone, and it is gone. A home run for Ted Williams in his last time that boy in the Major League. They're not born hitters or pitchers or managers, and luck isn't the key factor. No one has come up for a substitute for hard work. I've never met a great baseball player who didn't have to work harder at learning to play baseball than anything else he ever did. To me, it was the greatest fun I ever had, which probably explains why today I feel both humility and pride, because God let me play the game and to learn to be good at it. Proud because I've spent most of my life in the company of so many wonderful people. Ted, of course, that was your uh, Hall of Fame induction. And let's talk a little bit about the three of you. How much was uh, inherent talent and how much the intangibles have put you at this level. Larry? <laughs> well, I like to say it was a lot of hard work. I spent a lot of time out there practicing, trying to develop my skills from a young age. And um, sure, you know, I, I got the height. I was lucky enough to grow to be 6'9", but uh, um, the feel for the ball, the anticipation I might have got uh, from someone else down the family tree, but uh, I put a lot of time in. and. Uh, I'd say a lot of my skills come from hard work. Bobby? Well, I, I think we've uh, been blessed with an ability to play a sport, but as Larry said, I think it takes some hard work and love of the game. And uh, I certainly love my game, and I'm sure Ted and, and Larry love their games, and, and I, I, uh, I think that has a, a great deal to do with it. I think that, that, you know, Bobby Orr gives me, like, young Mr. Rogers vibes. Kind of like what Dutch T was alluding, alluding to. Really nice guy. <laughs> he's very polite. He's very, he's just so, he's just a nice guy. That's a nice ass guy, man. Mr. Rogers. What up? That if you're blessed with the talent 
and you can direct your interest and love towards the ability that you've got. In other words, I know I never could have been a, a basketball player nor a hockey player, but I love baseball so much and I lived in California. And here's where I think the luck of your life comes into it, that I lived in sunny California where I could play every day. Now they could play inside, he could play inside. But there's, uh, there's never been a great baseball player in Canada. However, there's one coming up, that Walker kid's a hell of a player. But you talk about luck in your, your, your birthplace in, Can in, in California. He's in Indiana, was a hotbed of basketball. Right. He was in uh, Paris Town, a hotbed of hockey. So well, you really all had that, that's you right. had that, that environment. Right. Well, we all grew up playing our respective sports and, and, and loved, to, loved to play them. As a kid, I'm sure the two gentlemen played Sandlot out on the street bouncing balls. I was shooting pucks all the time, playing uh, uh, hockey in the parking lots, whatever. Fate, luck. Let me ask you this, you guys. When did you know that you were better than everybody else at that level? There must have been some point that you knew, one, that you were better than everybody else. And when you moved up in competition, were you surprised you were still better? And how did, how did you react to that? Well, I, I, I never really thought about being better. All I know is I, I loved to play the game, and I was, uh, was, it was my dream to play the game, and I was getting an opportunity to, to play the game I, I loved. And, uh, and I wanted to, to get to the pros and, and stay there for a long time, but that's all I thought about. But thinking about being better than the next, sure, I think as you go through minor hockey and junior hockey, uh, yeah, you've, you know there's something there, but uh, I don't think you think about it a whole lot. You just... You have a goal, and you want right. to reach that goal. Mm -hmm. You guys uh, have different experiences about that, Larry, but you knew that, uh, I mean, the size was coming sooner Well, or later. in high school, I, I came from a small school. Most players that will say, no, I'm going to say most, especially some of the greats, are like, I just want to be the best player I can be. And where people think that lines up or stacks up against other people, that's not my concern. I just got to be the best player I can be and do everything I can do to squeeze the most out of my career and what I can do individually. There are some players out here that are so concerned about being better than a particular somebody else. It's weird. I mean, I get it, but it's weird. School, small town, and there was always doubt, well, you don't play against great competition. Same thing in college. and. I think it was after I got into pros, and I don't know if, it, if, if I was better than anyone else, but that team I was playing against that night, that's all that mattered, if I was the best player on the court that night. Then when the season's over and they said, well, you're the MVP this year, you know, that's fine. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think there, there were times out there where I knew I was the best player on the court. A lot of times. A lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> Quite yeah, naturally. A lot of times. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> It's just according to how the game, the flow of the game went. You know, right. There's a lot of times I had control of the game, I knew it, and well, I could do basically anything I wanted out there. Now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting happen every night. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it hasn't happened in the last two or three years. <laughs> Ted, you were... You know, I love Bird, but I love Bird because Bird, he's so humble. Uh, he keeps it real, even if it's poking at himself. <laughs> That's why I said this dude gives some of my favorite interviews, man, because he keeps it 100, and he's funny. <laughs> and he's comfortable. Bird is comfortable with himself, man. A lot of people aren't comfortable with themselves. A lot of people won't say something like that, whether they believe it or not. But Bird just kept it real. He's like, these last two years, bro, it's been rough. <laughs> we know, bro. We know your body failed you, but this is still hilarious. Oh, man. Bird ain't had no problem letting you know it out on, on, on the court in the game. He'll, he'll let you know how superior he is by telling you all kinds of stuff. <laughs> it's like indirect. It's not passive aggressive, but it's indirect. But he's basically telling you, I'm, I'm the bad man here. You know, telling coach, you better bring somebody else out. Bring somebody else out. Things like that. By your own admission, we're not the best player in your high school team. Absolutely, and, and I'll tell you, uh, I never did really... Sorry, I ain't going to try to pause too much. I'm interested to see what he says here. I look at so many greats, a lot of greats I've seen, we've seen, and a lot of them weren't the best player in high school. A lot of them weren't the best player on their college team. And look where they, look where they ended up. For all y'all young bucks out there,
The road ain't finished. We still paving that road, buddy. Keep working, keep striving. I really ever think I was better than anybody else. The only thing that stimulated me was when somebody w that I was playing against was doing a better job than I was doing. Mm. And he immediately became my challenge and my mm -hmm. target and my, mm. uh, the guy I was centered on. Young Ted and Williams. That was, and that was a, I think as I look back, a pretty good thing. I came up with the tag being extremely cocky. And I, and I can tell you from the heart, it, what I might have said might have sounded cocky, but I was really pretty frightened about it all for a long time. I never, uh, I knew after I'd played f four or five years, I, I, when I first come to the big leagues, I saw these big league hitters and I said, I think I can hit as good as any of those guys, being myself. But then after four or five years, I said, I know I can hit as good as any of those. So fear is a powerful motivator. I mean, so you have some fear inside of you, that fear of failure. Did you ever have any fear about... Never game. Uh, yeah. Every game. Did you? Oh, absolutely. Yes, sir. What, I fear, did. fear of what? Fear of not going out and, and doing the job. Well, doing the job. Why? Because you were expected, because you were at this level, that you were expected to do it? Well, I, I just think that I was scared before every game. Every big game, I just get so nervous. But once I got on the court, I was fine. But yeah. I think it was just because I knew I was playing against either Magic Johnson or Dr. J that I wasn't going to be able to hit my shot that night or things weren't going to be clicking. And once I got out there and hit a couple shots, I was fine, or once the game started. But uh, the fear from that 2 o'clock in the afternoon until game time, it, it, it got to where it hurt a lot of times. I, I think, I know, I was afraid of not, not performing properly. And I, and I think if you, you look at players like this, they all are, are afraid before the game that they're not going to perform the way uh, they're expected to perform. Amazing. I know for a fact in my own case that if I was worried about how well I was going to do against the pitcher, I fared a lot better than if I said, boy, he's my cousin. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I went over for 4. And I had one guy I thought I could really hit. And finally, one of the writers, the Knights, came up to <laughs> Knights me one time. Yeah, he came up to me one day and he said, you know, you're 0 for 12 against this guy. I said, what? You're 0 for 12. And then I start taking him serious again, and I did a little better. All right, it's amazing. Here we go. Larry Bird, uh, Ted Williams, and Bobby Orr. We'll be back with more in the special edition of Sports Final. Uh, stay with us. Bobby Orr, behind the net, the Sanderson to sports city in the world, certainly in North America, and uh, uh, much of the credit, much of the credit goes to those three people. And we're back with those three people, Larry, Ted, and Bobby. You know, I was, I was over at the sports museum yesterday, if these guys are human highlight films, you're a human scrapbook. I mean, that's just the way the years were. But How many championships do the Patriots the Bruins. What's the baseball team named in Boston? Red Sox, right? There's a red. There's a Red Sox and a White Sox, right? I think it's Red Sox. Boston Red Sox, right? Yeah, Boston Red Sox. If, if I'm wrong, correct me. The Major League Baseball team, which I'm assuming is the Boston Red Sox. The Bruins. Patriots and the Celtics. How many championships do they have all together combined? Best line that I heard from the talking about the three of you. If you were the raging bull of Boston sports, these two guys were the sacred cows. <laughs> and that goes into just saying what you said while we were off camera about your what you talk about Larry and Bobby and what people tell you. Well, yes, we were talking about that and even though I first time I've met Larry and I've had uh, a couple of experiences with my friend to the right. Uh, they, I've never heard a word ever that he's a pop-off or he is, uh, watch out for him. You know, you hear those words about a lot of people in times. And, um, but never have I ever heard a, a, a lousy word about Bobby nor Larry. And I mean, uh, there's got to be a reason for it. They're class guys and uh, they've been, uh, Best there ever was. Larry, did you? Uh, is this a story? I mean, you, all three of you guys have had. 
Yo, uh, Larry's a stand-up guy. We know that. Now, Bobby Orr, like I said, he gives off Mr. Rogers vibes, but he also gives off Norman Bates vibes. <laughs> Nicest guy in the world, right? Got the sweater and everything. Kind of got like the Norman Bates kind of face and hairdo. You go over his house, there's a whole body in his refrigerator. <laughs> mother, mother, Norman, Norman, mother. Coming upstairs, mother. <laughs> Classic Psycho movie. Even the old, the old Psycho movie still gives me the creeps to this day. But stand up guy, <laughs> stand up guy. <laughs> Y'all don't get mad. It's a joke. The Norman Bates thing is a joke. But you see where I'm coming from. That statues. Our fantasy was to have each one of those statues out here and have you guys walk out tonight. But yours is in Cooperstown and yours are in storage because the sports museum is moving. <laughs> but that was our thought. It would have been a great idea. It still was, but it wasn't going to happen tonight. When your statue was presented to you and uh, uh, La Montaigne uh, made the statue, you said that when you look up at, at during the national anthem, you look at his number four. Is that a true story? Oh yeah. Yeah. I always feel I need something to motivate me. You know, I always put, try to pump myself up for games, but. Every time you see, I seen a film clip of Bobby. It was always one where he hits a shot and dives across <coughs> the ice. Um, so before the national anthem, it was right above the scoreboard. I always look at Bobby's number to try to motivate me, and it always it always worked because I always played pretty well in the garden. I had some bad games, but you know I, I played pretty well in the garden. Just an extra motivational tool. So I'm thanks, Bob. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, those Thank bad you, games right. you looked at Phil Esposito. I, <laughs> I, I watched a little bit of basketball. I'm trying to think of that bad game Larry had. <laughs> But uh, you know, hearing something like that from Larry, obviously, it's it's uh, so. This it's is wonderful. I mean, you guys. This is really a mutual admiration society. Well, I've uh, you know I've watched Larry a long time, and and if if, if you look at Larry, you, you hear people say you know he you know he doesn't run real fast, he he doesn't jump real high, and yet you know what is it? Uh, it's his heart, it's his desire, it's his love for the game, and and. Uh, uh, he dives into the crowd, and that's what. That's why he's going to be go down as one of the great ones. Coming in tonight, I called a friend to say hello to him, and he started on Ted Williams. And he says, "You know, do you know?" He says, "You're from Canada. Do you know anything about baseball? You know, it's 17 Grand Slam, missed five years, which five of his best years. It's incredible, and still, it's true. He's five, the, five of his prime years in the service. Both you guys had your careers cut short." You, in effect, played maybe 11 years in, in total and before and you were hobbled. You played maybe eight years, and that, that's the most amazing thing. And of all the greatness, that, I mean, uh, for what... Uh, now, he didn't actually stay with Branch of Service he was in, but there was a comment that was made not too long, well, some, at some point earlier. I don't remember exactly what was said, but whatever he said about his time in the service or where he was stationed, where he was stationed, uh... He didn't say Air Force Base, but he, he said something to make me think he was uh, prior Air Force. My Air Force of Brotherin. It would have been, but Ted always said that the hardest thing in sports was to hit a baseball. Now, is this, do you still believe that? Or would you tell these guys the same thing? Well, I think that there's uh, a lot of elements that uh, would uh, uh, give you uh, a little weight behind that statement. Um, I told that to Sam Sneed one time. I said, Sam, look, are you hitting that round ball there, flat head? I said, it's smiling at you half the time. And I said, you whack it. I said, that's got to be easier than what I have to do. I'm hitting curve balls, knuckle balls with a round ball and a round bat. I said, it has to be harder hitting that. And of course, I was really kind of kidding him. And Sam says to me, he says, yeah, but he said, I have to hit my foul balls. <laughs> so he had a point there what about sure. what about, I mean, this is something to be said for what you, the punishment that you had to go through night in, night out. I mean, you had, that's a tough game at a tough level. Well, it is, but, um, you know, your body adjusts. I mean, you go out there and you bang yourself around the floor a few times. You get adjusted. Um, you don't feel it until the next day because you're so pumped up. But... Uh, I think it'd be pretty tough to hit a fastball for Roger Clemens. I mean, for me it would because I'd be bailing out every time. <laughs> Boston, this is the one common denominator. Other than your talent and your love of the game and the heart that you put into what you did, Boston, fate put you here. You stayed your whole careers here. Did that have 
an effect on, I know it had an effect in your lives, but the fact that you played everything in one town, forget the asterisk and the Chicago and all that experience, you all played your careers. What about the one town careers and playing in this town? Well, I, Boston is wonderful, great, great sports fans, Bob, tough. Uh, they expect an honest effort, but if you give them that honest effort, it's a wonderful city, but for your family, schools, shopping for the wives, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a wonderful city to, to, to be in, and, and when I left uh, Chicago, the first deci decision we made was that we wanted to live in Boston, bring our children up here, and, and we are here, and I think that says a whole lot about what we think about the city. Would you guys have, if, in baseball, and Bonds now with San Francisco, if that happens, Kirby Puckett Stadium in, in uh, Minneapolis may be the best decision he made, turn down more money to stay. Now, what about staying in the same city, and if free agency was available to you guys today, would you do it, honestly? I would. I would have, uh, you know, you can look at it both ways. Uh, Ruth has stayed here in Boston all his life. Instead of going to New York, where he got all the publicity and he had the great teams, and he got all the publicity and the, the one and only and mighty forever Babe Ruth. Um, I think that you'd have to say that that was a, a break for him. Again, I'll, I've always thought, maybe not my first three or four years I was here because I, took, I think, uh, quite a bit of heat from the Knights, but I want to tell you, I am so thankful that I had a chance to be here over the course of 20 years, and there's something about the fans in Boston that they're, they're big softies is what they are. They're loyal as they can possibly be. They are as ardent a sports fan as you can get any place. I think, I know for myself, I feel like I was extremely lucky to have played my career in Boston. Larry, you actually did have a shot to go, or a chance to go to free agency and uh, turned it down. But what are your thoughts and feelings about well, Boston and that I'll decision? let you on a little secret. About uh, three or four years ago, I was in Oakland, California, and I had a friend call me and said, hey, the Pacers are getting ready to make a deal for you. They're going to trade for you. And, you know, I was just sitting there on the phone thinking, God, the Celtics are going to trade me. I can't believe it. And after I got through talking to him, I hung up the phone, packed my bags because I was waiting for the coach to call me and tell me the deal was being done and I was going to retire from basketball right then so I, there's no way I would ever play for another team I would wow. I would have before I came here because I didn't know much about Boston but once I got here and got settled in and started playing I'm like Bobby if you give an honest effort out there the fans re react to that and once you get in one place and, and they start liking you it's hard to leave we talk about me and an alternate unit, an alternate universe, Larry Bird gets traded to the Indiana Pacers and retires. Wow. Your pressure, we're going to talk about this. You know, when he broke in, there were eight <coughs> daily newspapers. Eight daily newspapers, a smaller market. I mean, that was dog eat dog. Today, you got the TV stations, and, and, and but I think it's kind of a much softer and a kinder, gentler, to pardon the phrase of a friend of yours, a kinder, gentler approach. But what you had to endure is amazing. But we'll come back. We have a very special thing coming up in the next section. So stay with us. Sports Final continues with Larry, Ted, and Bobby here on uh, our stations tonight. Towns, now this will probably be the biggest, but uh, I think I can handle it. I know the, you know, since this is such a sport minded town and, and that's where I spit in. Sports is my life. I think I can fit in quite well. I think I can fit in quite well. I guess you fit in quite well. And uh, <laughs> you know what? It's, uh, for our, stations, our station in Terre Haute, that's, uh, this is very interesting. They're, they're going to be uh, broadcasting this little time. This show is being done live in Boston on a Saturday, Sunday night, and now it's Monday morning. We've passed midnight. And of course, uh, this happens to be uh, the birthday of one of our panelists. One of our panelists has now turned 36 years old. It is not Ted. <laughs> it is not Bobby. And it's not me. <laughs> so uh, I tell you what. I wonder what the scheduling conflicts was like to get these guys in so late at night. It had to be because of a scheduling conflict between everybody involved, or at least the main pieces. Uh, with further ado, we uh, ask you to turn around. Here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Larry. Happy birthday to you. Bob Newmeyer. <laughs> Take, let him get a shot of the cake here while we're doing this. It's, this is, uh, uh, Mike's pastry. Mike? 50 pounds of rum and strawberry. Right. <laughs> Bob asked me uh, what I could do to help with the show, and he says, Newmans, we need a cake guy. So that's my role in the show. Here it is, uh, 36 Thank candles you. celebrating 36 years in the life of uh, Larry Joe Bird. Thank you. Uh, right. We've got some gifts as well. I'm going to reach down Ooh, and... How many guys have a birthday? 
I'm old as I'm almost as actually yeah I'm almost as old as Bird at this time. Okay, Man. on the air, lie, right? No. Especially have. I know that. How many Ted guys have had Williams and Norris sing him Happy Birthday? Yeah. <laughs> Ted, here's, uh, here's one that I know you want to give to Larry. Oh yeah, Red Sox number nine. Thank you very That's much, Mr. Very Williams. Very great guy, Larry. I got a place for that. Yeah. Let's go, Larry. I know. You're a great skater and uh, you're never been on a pair of skates. Thank you. The chances are you're never going to be either. <laughs> never going Ted, to be. I, I knew you would be upset seeing Larry get a sweater and if you didn't get one. So there's Mr. Williams. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Our next fish on the trip. Oh, <laughs> scare the fish away. That's, yeah, that's terrific. Thank you, gentlemen. Is this mine? It's, yeah. It's just mine. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. That's Thank good. You. Thank oh, Bob, I'm sorry. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Bob, I'm just going to have a piece of the cake. The host. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. Blow out the candles so we can move on with the show. You don't want me to spit all over the candles. <laughs> Actually, it would make pretty good television. <laughs> all right, well, we'll let you off the hook and we'll come back. Happy birthday. Thank you. 36. Yes, and uh, having Ted Williams and Bobby Orr sing him happy a birthday. birthday. Party. Yeah, a birthday party. All right, we'll be back with more on Larry Bird's birthday and the sports <laughs> final as we continue right after this. You saw you saw Larry's you eyes light up when you when they said when they said rum cake he said oh, 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 oh. bring a beer out too while you at it when you have him right here and you can see him so many times and do this over and over again rise to these various occasions uh, it's something that uh, the fans in New England I know cherish beyond any question of doubt. We were just talking about the peripheral vision, you, the behind the back, that famous pass to Walton and uh, the parish, and just all the passes you made, and Ted, uh, his ability to see the seams of a baseball, and Bobby, you call them desperation passes, but they were right on somebody else's stick. So uh, well, I guess that just goes down to native ability, right? I mean, uh, well, I, uh, don't know, be so humble. I, I'm not being humble. You, you, you do anticipate sometimes, I think, but I think I'm watching Larry, and uh, Larry play the, the game of basketball. I mean, people say, well, Ah, stop telling that guy. That's who he is. This is a, this is a humble dude. He's a genuinely nice guy. He, I see him. He really like struggles inside to say anything like to boost himself up. Whether you know, even if it's true, it's just how humble he is. Like uh, that's what I'm. That's the energy I'm getting from Bobby. Well, how does he know they're there? I mean, he's passing like this and like that and like this and. You know, he looks ahead, he anticipates, he, he, he's just, it's like Gretzky in hockey, he's, he's looking ahead, he sees much further ahead than the other players. And Ted, great, great eyesight, Ted says that you do not see the stitching on the ball. Yeah, but you uh, hit the right word. The anticipation the that you guys had, I think, is even, even a greater asset than the eyes and the hand and all that business because you got to figure it out before it even starts and you make it look easy and slow, not fast and and so quick that your reactions took over. I think that that uh, the your, how you how you anticipated as you're coming in there. You know that's really interesting. We're talking about team sports. He could control his game, or could control his game like no other. I mean, control it. Maybe it's the nature of hockey. You couldn't control your game. You got four at bats a game. You might have a couple fly balls hit to you. You might have a chance to run. You had eight other guys. You had to depend on totally different orientation. Plus. They played with championship teams. What you had to do in your career was to really motivate yourself, which brings my next question about the press. And uh, often tempestuous and stormy, what is your view of the role that the media played in building your sports images in this town, and was it justifiable? Ted? Well, you got to say Boston's a great sports town, and they've had some great performers here. But I do think that the, the, uh, the controversy I think the keenness of some of the sports writers uh, certainly helped to develop uh, the feeling of, of uh, Boston sportsdom. And uh, I would give them some credit in that regard uh, because uh, uh, they seemed to always stir up something that stimulated one way or another. Uh, the sport of the day. Oh, look at this headline. <laughs> Ted may get 80 to 100 G's. It was like, uh, this was 1949. They, people were shocked that Ted may get 80 to 100. That's what you're getting for doing this show tonight, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, didn't I tell you other guys? I'm sorry. I hope so. <laughs> I forgot to tell you and Larry. <laughs> but uh, what about the press? 
Per said, give me my money, mofo. <laughs> Larry, and uh, your image of it and the creation, how they created your image and, and your sports legacy. Well, it def definitely helps. I mean, if it went the other way, they could run you out of town, too. There's no question about it. But, uh, you know, if, if I played a game and I read an article the next day, that's not the same game I played. I haven't seen one guy I could put in words and strive a game like I seen it. I always thought they were putting things in, in different places where they should have been over here and they're putting them down here at the end. But I, I, I just never thought, seen a guy that could write about a game the way I seen in the game or the way I played the game. So, uh, but as far as building, a, a, making a superstar of somebody, I, I think that's very easily done. Did they have that same uh, lack of hockey knowledge that he's suggesting they had in no, the past? No, I, I don't think so. I think overall the press is very good in Boston. Many times we, the professional athlete, gives them, give them ammunition uh, to write uh, poor stories or what you might consider a bad story. But overall, I, I think the, the press in, the, in this town, there's a lot of competition with radio, TV, and, and, and newspaper. Overall, I think uh, they're pretty good. I think they're pretty knowledgeable. They can be tough. Uh, without uh, without question, but many times we give them that ammunition they uh, they need to write a, a poor story. Ted, you I mean you're you're but, the one that had the feuds. Well, you know you're you're talking to two fellows here, who um, I don't ever remember hearing any bad press about them. Well, like uh, I said, you were the raging bull; they were the <laughs> sacred cows. Yeah, that's right. And um, uh, I know that I I'm knowing my heart that I got a lot of rotten. Uh, r remarks written about me Rotten because, tomato reviews um, that weren't true and I was just rebellious enough at times to uh, throw a little static at them and they didn't like that and uh, I think a lot of it I brought on myself by not being quite as mature as I should have been but uh, that's all part of a career and and uh, you look back on it now and you say well I couldn't have changed anything because Nothing was predetermined. I, that's what happened, and that's the way it happened. And, and uh, some of it turned out worse than I thought, or better than I said. <laughs> you read the stuff. Larry said he read the game stories. Did you read the press uh, every day about Bobby Orr and the Bruins' performance? Is this? And did you pay any attention to it? And oh, I think you do read some of it. I don't. I didn't read it all. I didn't see it all. I didn't. Did you ever get any bad write-ups? Oh yes. You did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think the, the great athletes <laughs> read it. Ever. See, 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 Williams is like, bro, I'm going to tell you what. See, y'all, y'all, y'all the golden boys right there. I don't ever hear anything bad said about y'all, especially right here in Boston. But I'm going to tell you what things was getting rid of about me. I saw all the stuff. I know what a bad write-up is. I know what a bad review is. I know what an unhealthy critique is, inaccurate. He's like, y'all ain't, y'all ain't seen what I seen. Y'all ain't got that. Y'all ain't got that. So he said, hey, you ever got one? He's like, yeah, he's probably looking like, bruh, that write-up was like a, write, a good write-up for me on a good day. <laughs> day. I mean, there's no sense in reading it every day. I mean, you don't run to the store to get the paper to read it. It's, it's not worth it. I mean, you, if you ain't got nothing to do and paper's laying there, you usually read it. If somebody else buys it, I usually read it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same with going to the movies for you. That's right. <laughs> But I, I don't. I, you never get caught up. You, the, you get good press, bad press. It, it, you know, you, you don't get great things written about you every day. But there's good in it. And there's some bad in it. So you just take it for what it's worth. When you're talking about uh, bad press, I mean, if you if, if you played a poor game and then they're going to write about that, uh, that's not bad press. I think you expect that if you if you play a poor game, they're going to write you. Play a poor but you game. didn't have eight daily newspapers trying to survive <laughs> by writing about you. I mean, I, I'm just saying that yeah. you were in the middle era. Oh, Eight daily newspapers and a couple of mornings and a couple of afternoons, and you were in every one of them every day. That's pretty intense. Yeah, I know some of them didn't like me, too. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to believe. I was, a bad... I was actually going to allude to that. There definitely are some biases in the journalist, the journalist world, the world of journalism, and if a guy doesn't like you for whatever reason or they have some type of vendetta against you for whatever reason, they will find ways to make you look bad and try to make your life a living hell through the through the avenues of the media. And even today I see that. Today, especially in the NBA, how some players are treated because they have a uh, they've had a bad run in with a specific media member or a team of media members. I see it. I see it.
<laughs> We're going to take a break here and more of a sports final. We'll be back with uh, another segment here with uh, Larry, Ted, and Bobby here in the special edition of sports final. Think smart. We wanted Bob to help us raise funds for the Boys and Girls Club. Yeah, of course, my job was to make him look good. He certainly did that. Next on A Different World, Whitney's in Art. All right, this is our final segment on this uh, visit from the three on four here in a sports final. <laughs> it's not that bad. Uh, Larry, Ted, and Bobby. Uh, Ted and Bobby, you've been retired, Hall of Fame, numbers retired. What do you know that Larry doesn't know about retirement? And what kind of stages is he uh, going to be going through? Well, i got about 20 years on him to start with. And um, I'm really, I I'm really feel fortunate that I had fishing interests and I even had some business interests and I was lucky in that regard because it was with uh, dealing with hunting and fishing and guns and tackle and uh, uh, I was lucky in that regard after I got through that I could still had a lot of interests uh, but I'm, I'm, I, I, I really am glad that I had a chance and fishing meant so much to me because I'm going to be able to fish as long as I live. As long as you live. I can't play tennis anymore and I can't play golf anymore. You know, Larry, Larry is going to need about a year, year and a half to get it out of his system. Uh, he's, uh, it's been, something's been taken away from him that he's played all his life. So he's, he's going to go through a period, but in talking with Larry before the show, he's keeping very busy and that's very, very important. But it's, it's going to take a while. Uh, his one day his back is going. He thinks it's going to feel pretty good, and he might think maybe I could still play. <laughs> uh, but he's going to go through a period. It's going to take a little, a little bit of time. But he's keeping very busy, and that's that's. Not 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 every player goes through that. A lot, a lot of players do struggle with being out the game after they retire. But I know some where they had already started during the, their career. They already started building the pathways and the goals for retirement. So when they were done with it, they were like, I, I don't miss it at all. And I found something else I'm passionate about. So depends, everybody's different. It's real important for Larry right now to keep busy and uh, and uh, things will be fine, he'll do well. I think he knows he's got an emotional night ahead of him on February 4th, I guess uh, that goes without saying, huh? No question about it, it's gonna be a big night and uh, I think I'll do all right. Uh, you know, the big night was the night before I retired that was the one that hurt the most. Uh, but uh, I really haven't been out in front of the fans since then, so sure it'll be emotional, but um, I should be able to handle it pretty well. Want to practice here a little? <laughs> <laughs> so not that, really. No, not really. I mean, I remember in your <coughs> retirement number, there was a lot of tears and uh, from, on both sides of the ice, from you and from a lot of the fans. Uh, he said, and then Ted, uh, the same guy thing. when Yaz retired, he went around and touched everybody at Fenway Park. But you guys had a special connection to the Boston fans. You know it, whether it was through your greatness, but there was a special chemistry that each one of you had in a special way with those fans. Uh, can you explain it, Larry? Do you, do you, can you put it into words? You know, you didn't meet them. You probably felt like you signed everyone's autograph. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I think just like we, we talked about earlier, you know, you go out there and, and if they know you're giving 100%, they like you. And if you're a special player to them, they like you even more. Um, it's, it's really hard to, to pinpoint the reason, but I always felt that I had a good relationship with them, and I needed that. They motivated me to levels that I didn't think I could ever reach in basketball. That was very important to me. If you could play another sport and be as proficient in another sport as you were in the one that you've chosen, what would it be? Baseball. Uh, you'd be baseball? Oh, I, Why? I, I love baseball. I like baseball. I, I play a little bit, and I, I really enjoy baseball. Larry? Baseball. Hey. Yeah. Same, huh? You would have loved to... Would you have traded all this basketball stuff for baseball? You would have traded all this hockey stuff for baseball? You said if we... If okay, we, okay. No, <laughs> <laughs> really? um, no I'm, I'm in love with uh, basketball, but uh, I enjoy play, uh, pl playing ba baseball. Uh, used to play a lot of baseball. Used to play a lot of softball. He says, you see Ted? his finger? Oh, no question. You see baseball his finger? Was, was my life, the greatest love of my life, everything that happened to me. I, but there's one thing you brought up earlier tonight, you, about uh, their, their busts and their, their uh, sculptures and all the rest of it. The one that I 
had that's in Cooperstown. Uh, I shed a tear that day. And there I was with my statue there by Montaigne. And it was a hitting shot. But as I looked at that statue of me, mm -hmm. I could see over about 60 feet mm -hmm. the statue of Babe Ruth. And that brought a tear to my eye because there was only one forever and always Babe Ruth. And uh, as a kid, I thought that. And uh, there's my statue right there in view of the mighty Ruth. And I, a lot of things came together, you know, and I realized how lucky I'd been in my sport. I guess uh, when you think back and you said it, uh, do you stop every once in a while and say, why, why me, why this life, why this happened to me, why am I so blessed, do I deserve it, all these things, Larry? Every day, especially when I'm home in Indiana and look at the house and the cars, sitting there by yourself at the pool and you go, why me? And uh, I know I spend a lot of time, but still I don't understand it, never will understand it. I, I have problems with people coming up to me and asking me for my autograph because I can't believe it. Uh, it's mind-boggling, but it happened and it's over with, and now I go on with my own life. Bobby? I'm a lucky guy. It's a wonderful country. Well, both countries. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Ted feels the same way. I mean, I, you know, you say, why, why were you guys so blessed? And why was this town so blessed? This town has had its share of tragedies. No, make no mistake about it. But you guys uh, were the compensation for all those bad moments. I, I relate it to a lot of luck in life. And um, I was thinking about this program. And I was thinking about how close I come. I know how close I come in my life several times of having it all in right there. But I remember one time in my sport to come awfully, awfully close, the closest I'll ever come to getting crunched by baseball. And it was against score, and he could throw the ball almighty fast. And uh, I would, I had hit him well, I'd hit him well. And uh, I got a, out of the way of a pitch. Today, I don't know how it ever happened, how I got out of the road. And I feel that I was extremely lucky that pitch to get out of the road. Luck plays a big part of it, but uh, all that skill and all that fun that you brought here. Thank you all for being here tonight. Larry, Ted, Bobby, this is a unique program. Aren't many things that it's great to be on with him. <laughs> it's great to be on with you guys, and uh, I'm sure they all feel the same way, and so does our audience tonight. Thank you very much for being with us on the special edition of Sports Final. There aren't many things, as I said, that you can do for the first time in this business anymore, but this is it. And we've had a great thrill having all of them here, and we've enjoyed it. Boy, that that uh that jacket Larry got on is fly. This must be the extra footage Dutch T was talking about. Larry looking up in the rafters. Look how Larry looking at that rum cake. <laughs> Teddy getting ready for it. Number nine. Clean. And DJ holding that cup happy as happy as ever. I'm only doing this for Children's Hospital. Can you believe it? The BZ Children's Hospital. In front of the fire to get out and get to work, to split those rails or chop down those trees to clear the farmland or to work behind the plow. Hey, thanks for the recommendation. Uh, Book Mom and Dutch Tea. That, 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 that was dope. That was dope. Yeah, I'll tell you, I have never heard of Bobby Orr before or Ted Williams. I had no clue who these guys were. The only person I knew was Larry Bird. But having those three guys sit down together was uh, was interesting, even though uh, I was actually curious, you know, how they would talk to each other when they agreed on a, or disagreed on a topic. But uh, nobody stepped on anybody else's shoes, per se. You know, they gave their honest thought and opinion. And... Uh, came back to the other guy and he said yeah i mean well he didn't say that but it was like yeah there's good press there's bad press but just gotta stay away from it things like that but but ted williams uh, he's a, he's he's the old guy you know with the knowledge with more experience he's like yo yo you think you got bad press brother you ain't seen bad press cut it out <laughs> y'all two are saints <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, 
That was good. I'll tell you what. Uh, like I said, I don't know shit about baseball. But I'll, I'll tell you this. Just me, you know, watching the, the, the little bit I've seen of baseball and understanding the general concept of the game. I've always said, and I will continue to say, without ever playing baseball, baseball appears to me to be one of, if not the hardest sport to play, one of the hardest sports to play, man. Just so many calculations are going down in your head based on how many men are on the base. What bases are the men on? Like, especially if you're an outfielder. You know, what bases, if the ball goes this way and this guy catches it, we all have to have like this hive mindset where we all know where that guys are on the base and where the ball's at. Who can it be? Who can it be expecting to pass? And who? Where does the ball go after that? You know, that's tough. That's tough to all be on the same accord, more or less, and to uh, having to anticipate the pass, having to throw it right, line drive, catch it, and get the ball where it needs to be next. And then, you know, what happens if the runner decides, screw it, I'm running back now. You have to make the calculations over again. Now where do I put the ball now that he's retreating back to the other base? Or should I run him? Let alone being a hitter. How hard it is to hit a baseball coming at you? Freaking 80 miles per hour, 90 miles per hour, whatever it is. And be a pitcher? I said, man, baseball, I have a lot of respect for baseball players. Really do. Mm. I actually wanted to play hockey when I was younger. Um, I lived in Florida, so you know, county league. You know, it was roller hockey, and I guess if you got good, you find your up, find your way up to ice hockey in college. But it was generally roller hockey. Uh, not, I'm not sure what it was in our high school if it was still roller hockey or ice hockey. I, we didn't, we didn't have an ice rink anywhere in our city so I, I can't imagine did, 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 I'm not even sure we had a hockey team at my high school I gotta go get the year next time I go visit my parents I gotta go get a yearbook that's gonna be about another 8 to 10 months but yeah next time I visit my parents uh, I'm gonna go check that out in the yearbook cause I'm curious but yeah I, I like all these guys personalities or Humble, humble, humble guy, man. Really, really, really nice, man. He he, he won't say a bad thing about nobody. It, it ain't in his blood. It ain't in his blood. It ain't. Um, and I, I I like Ted Williams vibes. <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's a talker, not in a bad way, but like he's a, he's a good storyteller, and uh, he knows how to talk. He knows how to talk. And bird is is the word. What do you mean? Bird is the word. Word. Bird is the word. I tell you what, too, um, based on Dutch T's comment, when I think of Bill Russell, like personality-wise, I see a lot of Bobby Orr and Bill Russell. They have a strikingly similar personality. Uh, and, and, and Larry Bird, too, to a somewhat lesser degree. But I see a lot of Bobby Orr and Bill Russell, like personality-wise. Boy, you, you couldn't you couldn't get Bill Russell to say a damn thing bad about anybody. And really really the same for Bird too. But Bird Bird got that dry, witty humor, you know, really, really jokey side. Um that I don't think Bill Russell had as much or Bobby Orr seems to have without me knowing much about him. So that's why I lumped those two together. But uh yeah, they they yeah. Yeah, I do. I really do. Anyway, like I said, like I told you guys, I don't I don't know anything about these other two sports, the bare minimum. And like I said, I just found out about these two players. Um, but let me know, man. If you y'all you, you, Boston people, let me know what you think about Bobby Orr and Ted Williams and Larry Bard Bird. I, they got They got I don't know if Ted Williams and Bobby Orr are still alive, but if they are, they got to do this again. But you got to bring Tom Brady on board now. Now that Tom Brady's done and retired, you got to do this again with Tom Brady. I don't know if Bob LaBelle's still alive, and I'm sure that show is gone, but somebody has to make this work. Bring these four guys together. Rest in peace, Bill Russell. Tell Brady to get off his diet. 
tell him to get off the Tinder app because I know he on Tinder now. That him and whatever his wife's name are divorced. Get off Tinder, man. Come hang out with the boys. Come hang out with the other Boston greats. Let's have a sit down. Let's talk about it. I would love to hear Brady. Man, I would love to see Brady and Bird sit next to each other. Icons. Like, comment, subscribe again. Thank you for the recommendation. And I'll catch you on the next one. We out, baby.